Good afternoon, everyone. Yes, hi. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the uh, bi-weekly, I guess, Urban Institute seminar series. I'm Gail Geller. I'm faculty at the Urban Institute and the School of Medicine. And I have the great good fortune to introduce our speaker today. Um, I have known Eric Young probably since 1990, I think. Um, and uh, we've been good friends and colleagues ever since. So Eric is a professor in the Department of Social Medicine and the Department of Genetics at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and the director of the UNC Center for Bioethics. Um, he was recruited there in 2005, no, 2010, to, to run the center. And he was recruited there from Case Western Reserve, where he had been a professor for a long time and um, ran there uh, Center for um, Excellence in LC Research, which is the, the SEER program, um, and was the principal investigator of the case SEER for 10 years, I guess, mm -hmm, before he moved to UNC. Um, he got his PhD in philosophy from Georgetown in 1985, and I believe, were you in the same class as Jeff Kahn? Or same groups, general? No, no, I went way ahead. <laughs> I both trained at Georgetown in philosophy. Um, and I know Eric uh, initially as he was the first um, chief of the ethical, legal, and social implications branch at the National Human Genome Research Institute, where he served from 1990 to 1994. Um, and I've been part of the LC research community from the beginning. And so um, Eric kind of spearheaded the first ever LC grant that was awarded happened to be awarded to Hopkins. Um, um, anyway, he really has particular interest and expertise uh, in the conceptual and ethical issues raised by new advances in human genetics and biotechnology, um, among many, many other uh, areas of expertise, professional and, and <laughs> avocational. Um, anyway, please uh, join me in welcoming Eric Youngst. I will read his title. Uh, 
uh, combating disease to try to improve on human form and function. So I want to tell you a little bit about the problem that we saw and the observations that were motivating us. And then um, ask about how we could go about addressing these issues in governance and what we want to do in our project. But first, uh, this is well-timed talk. Actually, you know, I was supposed to give this talk last December and got snowed out. Um, but uh, now I'm happy because last week gave me the perfect intro to the talk over at the National Academy uh, in an effort to foment public dialogue. Uh, they posted this tweet. Do you dream of being stronger or smarter or having a top student or star athlete or a child free from inheritable diseases? Well, learn more at our website. Almost immediately, it was replaced by this. We deleted an earlier post on human genome editing. Uh, our report recommends that we should not proceed with genome editing for purposes other than treatment or prevention of disease. Here's our report. Check it out. Uh, the, the tweet came along with a video that was posted on their website, um, and it was of a similar vein. That they you showed a picture of a template of a body and members of the public standing around deciding how they would like to improve on the human design and uh, say things like, sure, hmm, let's prevent baldness, that would be good, I'd like to be, as long as I could have some control over it, um, I don't hate that idea. Somebody hated it though, because <laughs> the page was removed. <laughs> From the video was removed from the website, um, and this notice was uh, put up. We're concerned that the content of the video left the misimpression that the use of genome editing for the enhancement of human traits is permissible. When actually we said it should be limited to treatment or prevention of disease. Clearly, this is going to require more research and public discussion. So, this minor, uh, a cringeworthy moment in the life of the National Academy um, leaves me with three points to point out. Enhancement, obviously, is still out in terms of official, official attitudes towards where translational research and gene editing should go. Please, not towards enhancement. But an interesting change from the past is that it's not just treatment anymore, it's treatment or prevention. Prevention is in. Uh, that's not surprising given what we've experienced with the growth of genomic medicine in general, not gene editing, but uh, the other side of genomics, predictive testing and, uh, and preventive interventions um, using genetic prediction. Prevention seems to be uh, right at the top of the priority list for medical genomics, so naturally it's here too. And then I guess the third lesson of this little episode is that trying to come up with engaging ways to have public dialogue is a fraught process. Uh, it's complicated to have the kind of thoughtful discussions you'd like to have and not, as the uh, concerns were, that uh, they were, we were taking too lightly the serious issues involved. Well, what's the background of this? Since the mid-80s, when people started thinking about when it would be okay to use old-fashioned recombinant DNA methods to uh, engineer the human uh, genome, it's been guided by this, this box. Leroy Walters at Georgetown came up with this, and you see it in um, well everywhere. Uh, the idea was that really we should only be <coughs> concentrating on doing somatic cell interventions for therapeutic purposes. Um, it's too unsafe. We know too little to dabble in the human germline 
working on embryos. So let's not go there. And it's too morally uh, problematic to try to decide what's going to count as an improvement in the human design and uh, who gets to say what counts as an improvement. So let's not go there either on moral grounds. This, what were the concerns? What are those moral grounds? Well, not much consensus there, but lots of literature. Uh, and if you look at the bioethics literature on enhancement and the uh, descriptions of what's worrisome about improving ourselves through genetic engineering, uh, you see these kinds of themes coming up again and again. On the face of it, after all, we're always trying to improve ourselves, right? Uh, enhancement doesn't seem just in and of itself to be a particularly problematic uh, human activity. Isn't that what music lessons are for and all that? Um, but genomic enhancement has sparked conversations uh, along these lines, worried about what sort of competitive advantages an enhancement, a genetic enhancement, might provide someone in a social context, and the fairness of, of how those might be distributed across society. Worries about the quality of access to the interventions and the effects on uh, justice as the haves get access to the interventions and the have-nots don't. Worries about whether Achievements achieved with the help of genomic enhancements would in some way really be the actor's achievements or uh, less authentic. And worries about the value of the kind of human nature we've inherited from our ancestors. The um, traditional life cycle. Should we mess with that? The traditional form and function of the human body. Should we? Uh, try to uh, change that, and can we do it wisely enough not to run into trouble? Well, with the advent of CRISPR, as I mentioned, there was this tidal wave of reports um, suggesting where we should go now that the tools we have actually um, make it feasible to think about crossing both those lines, the germ line and the enhancement line. And almost all these reports uh, hold the line at enhancement. Many of them are willing now to think about whether we've reached the stage where it's, it's reasonable to crack the door open to the germline interventions, at least to do the research to see if it would be safe. Uh, but everybody is saying no to enhancement. So now this is a, a, how the box is standing. Still, no on moral grounds to trying to improve on the human design. One of the long-standing criticisms of this of the box and of the line has been about the conceptual difficulty of knowing when something is an enhancement, when it's moved from being a treatment to an enhancement. And the doorway has always been uh, prevention. So, for example, here's a uh, slide from an a article on gene therapy for cancer. That's therapy. That's a treatment for cancer. That's a disease. Okay, that's good. Um, but the researcher puts it, his work this way. Some of our approaches target healthy cells to enhance their ability to fight cancer. We're improving a patient's immune response to stimulate the body's natural ability to fight cancer. Well, in fact, if they are successful, uh, they're hoping they can give the patient's immune system a superpower, a super ability to seek out and destroy cancer cells compared to the rest of us. Is that enhancement or is that just prevention in the good old medical sense of getting out in front of a disease and forestalling. And if it is technically some kind of enhancement, um, do we care? Because after all, these people have 
cancer. And uh, having a better immune system is just one way to fight that. So what's happened in the new wave of reports, I think, has been the uh, acknowledgement that, right, we have to make some room for cancer vaccinations and other forms of prevention. So let's just add a new drawer to the box. Uh, therapy, good to go in somatic cells. We'll do uh, clinical trials with CRISPR and gene editing, and there's a whole slew of those now uh, coming out. And uh, prevention, why not? Why not look at ways we can use gene editing to uh, get out in front of diseases, progressive diseases, or diseases of late life, and forestall them? But that's different than enhancing people for social purposes, or to give them traits that might raise those enhancement concerns about authenticity, fairness, or justice. Well, how will we know uh, when we slipped across that line from prevention into enhancement? The literature on the distinction itself is big and argumentative. One of the things about the germline line was that, at least conceptually, it's easy to know when you've crossed it. When you've done something that's inherited by the next generation, uh, you've crossed the line and you're, now you're working in the germline. How do we know when we've crossed the line into enhancement? Well, what does the, the distinction mean? A whole lot of uh, different views on that, which I won't go through. It's another seminar, another interesting paper, but lots of ways to slice the pie in trying to come up with a line drawing mechanism to say things on this side of the line are treatments and things on that side of the line are those problematic enhancements we worry about. Um, in fact, the wobbliness of the line, the, the um, uh, semi-permeability of the line, it's led a lot of philosophers to suggest it's not a line worth keeping for policy purposes. Um, it's just, uh, it's too easy to, to drive something through it under the rubric of prevention. So, by default, if we can't tell when something is an enhancement or a preventive intervention or a treatment, what should the default be? Maybe in that case we should take a more liberal stance like we do with other areas of moral uncertainty and say, let everybody decide for themselves. Nice uh, long lineage now already of uh, philosophers and bioethicists suggesting a, um, we should go in the direction of opening up these interventions to uh, individual uh, uh, decision making and a liberal eugenics. Um, intentionally recognizing that eugenics is the third rail as a word in many of these discussions and immediately will get people thinking about how this could all go wrong. So today's question is, if we want to continue, if the policy makers, the science policy makers, for whatever reason, feel like we need to accept the convention, the significance of the conventional enhancement boundary. And sure, there are good reasons, I think, to worry about those concerns that are usually discussed under the label of enhancement. But we also want to endorse prevention as a legitimate goal for gene editing research. How should we deal with preventive enhancements and preventive interventions, preventive gene editing, that raise those same ethical questions that we have traditionally said keep us from going and cross the line into enhancement. Because um, science has been marching on in the background of all this, um, quite outside the domain of gene editing and CRISPR, just in terms of genomics itself. Uh, for a long time, 
the action was in medical genomics, trying to locate and uh, uh, analyze the pathogenic variants of different genes, the ones that cause diseases. Also, we've been interested in trying to figure out how genes work when they work correctly. So the benign variants in our genome are also of interest. And those variants of uncertain significance, which genetic counselors have to wrestle with, uh, we're interested in decoding those as well. Now, there's a wave of research coming from, well, waves, I guess it's not a single wave, but they're, they're uh, bubbling up uh, research interest in going beyond simply figuring out how benign, ordinary, functional variants work, to isolating the beneficial variants, the variants that seem to be associated with high functioning at the end of the uh, spectrum of functional ability. Lots of terms for this in the literature and uh, in, in the uh, world of commercial direct consumer genetic testing. Uh, wellness genomics, we're not just interested in the genomics of disease, but in the genomics of excellence. Uh, positive genetics, particularly that's what the psychologists like to call it because of associations of positive psychology. Resilience, genetics, etc. And um, <coughs> Part of this interest is in finding these beneficial variants in order to use them to resist disease. So the genome writers um, set their first goal. This is about an initiative from Eric Landers Institute to recode human cells to resist viruses. Um, similarly, Here's an article about genetic mutations you want uh, because they are, are going to help you achieve your goals. Genetics, athletic status, and training, and overview. And in fact, while that's going on in basic genetics, an interest in the genetics of high functioning, um, over in the animal research world, we're already moving on to thinking about how to develop the techniques to use these beneficial variants as preventive tools. Um, in mice, in the lab, of course, we're trying to engineer uh, resistance to HIV into mice. Uh, we all know about that story now from it, the uh, interventions into humans in China last year. Uh, other ones are uh, CRISPR treatments to prevent hearing loss which actually have the effect of improving hearing acuity in these mice as a side effect over normal. And um, activation of the clotho protein, which helps both extend your lifespan and um, raise cognitive ability in mice. But what a nice way to prevent deteriorating diseases like Alzheimer's disease. And on the farm, Lots of interest in making, uh, enhancing animals, and there are no qualms about using that language there, uh, to resist the, the conditions of modern farming. And even in your home, there's this great project at, out in the West Coast, the Dog Aging Project, designed to increase the lifespan of our domestic pet dogs because it's such a shame. You know, you just get to love them and they pass away so quickly. Wouldn't it be great to have a 40-year-old dog? 40-year-old cat? <laughs> but anyway, they're working on it. And immediately, um, it doesn't escape them that if they work out how to extend the lifespan in dogs, healthy lifespan, um, it will have applications in people as well. So it's life extension. Uh, under the banner of prevention, preventing those diseases of late life. Here are some uh, examples arrayed across the spectrum of kinds of prevention, you know, this uh, hierarchy of forms of prevention that people from 
public health and preventive medicine might be used from everything from uh, tertiary prevention, which is blends into treatment pretty heavily, uh, suppressing the clinical symptoms of existing diseases, all the way down to primary prevention, preventing you from getting infected in the first place, to health promotion, and then finally, uh, out and out, uh, improving abilities to achieve social goals or enhancement. So the, on, the, on the right side are various different kinds of projects and initiatives that are trying to use, trying to locate the, the beneficial genetic variants in order to translate that into preventive uh, interventions. Neither the basic research, the bench research, isolating and, and uh, decoding, analyzing these beneficial variants, nor the animal research are topics of discussion in the wave of gene editing policy reports, because they've all focused on the clinical application of gene editing to human beings. Meanwhile, of course, uh, both of these uh, streams are feeding into the pipeline, the translational pipeline, that will lead to proposals for uh, clinical trials of, of gene editing at some point. Um, they're kind of uh, invisible at the moment, but these are the sorts of protocols that somebody uh, governing gene editing research is going to have to face. So what about this question of using gene editing for to strengthen resistance and resilience? Um, is that something that governance should worry about? And if so, uh, how should we go about dissecting it? Here's a great example also just from last week. Um, DARPA, our defense research <coughs> agency. The, Stephen Walker, the director, is uh, looking forward to the day when we can use gene editing to make soldiers biologically adaptable to threats, biowarfare and chemical warfare threats, um, so, that, so that they can uh, be protected from them. You want to be able to actually have your body be the antibody factory if possible because you can't possibly come up with vaccines for all these things. Um, but even though we're going to have uh, soldiers which have wonderfully adaptive immune systems and resist biological weapons and chemical warfare, we're not out to make super soldiers, he says. Rather, to make soldiers who can be kept safe. It's protection. I think our focus is about protection and restoration versus enhancement. Uh, all these technologies, they have dual use. They are dual use. You can use them for good and you can use them for evil. DARPA is about using them for good to protect our war fighters. <laughs> well, this, the question of protection in the military context goes back a long way. Um, and we've always walked this line between um, prevention or enhancement. Was a suit of armor prevention or enhancement? Um, I tried to do a little ethnographic research on this topic a couple of weekends ago. I went to a meeting of guys who make armor for a living and asked them, is, is armor really for protection or is it more for, to enhance the fearsomeness of the warrior, you know, enhance his effectiveness as a fighter, etc. And and their response was, right. Well, you have to realize the first purpose of medieval armor was to make you look fabulous, <laughs> and the second function was to make you look fabulous, <laughs> and the third function was maybe it provided some protection. So it really was about enhancement, enhancing the physique of the, uh, of, of, the of the night. Um, it may be that these super resilient war fighters will uh, function similarly. It's a little bit of protection when you're in the military, then when you get out, uh, you've got a wonderfully equipped body for 
dealing with all kinds of um, exposures, smog, pollution, poisons, that the rest of us won't have. So what, what should we anticipate? What kind of incidental enhancements or preventions that raise enhancement concerns might we see coming? Some of them you might call compensatory enhancements because like that cancer vaccination uh, example, they simply compensate for some existing disease. For example, there's a, a gene variant in the gene DEC1 that enables its carriers to get by with much less sleep than the rest of us and not suffer the sequelae of sleep deprivation. <laughs> wow, cool. Uh, the literature says, oh, we should do something with this. What, what can we do with it? Well, Maybe it could be a um, treatment for people with severe sleep disorders, insomnia and that sort of thing. They can't sleep, so maybe we should just enable them to do it less sleep by giving them this uh, variant. Well, they can't, okay, great, they need less sleep than the rest of us, but it's no longer killing them because they no longer suffer the effects of sleep deprivation. So they can go out and be productive and have a competitive advantage over the rest of us. Is that a problem or is it just kind of fair compensation for the fact that they have to have sleep disorders? I mean, what's, what should we do about that as this kind of spin-off of their treatment if they get an advantage over the rest of us? Similarly, some interventions even if the intervention is not an enhancement in itself, um, would have side effects, enhancing side effects. Clotho, I, the gene I mentioned, is an interesting one because the rationale in the literature for exploiting it and exploring it is to prevent the diseases of senescence, prevent the diseases that come with the, the aging process. Um, in the process, if you are able to control the aging process, control senescence, get out in front of the, the ways our bodies uh, deteriorate, you'll also extend the lifespan significantly, 30% in mice. You have some, uh, uh, and there's even uh, reports that it improves cognitive function. So would it be acceptable, could we tolerate those enhancements if they came at the, uh, in, uh, in the name of preventing low cell life diseases. A third category are interventions that are clearly developed for therapeutic purposes but might be used in healthy people for enhancement off-label as it were. Uh, MSDN is a gene related to muscle development if you have the variant that gives you, uh, increases the strength and endurance of your muscles. It's a great treatment for muscular dystrophy maybe, um, but quite outside of the medical context, what athletes would want to uh, get hold of that to improve their strength and endurance of their long muscles for athletic purposes. Scientific community often responds to this by saying that's an issue for society. Yes, you've got to police those off-label uses, but I'm developing this for medicine for, to use with muscular dystrophy. It wouldn't be fair for me to stop this research just because somewhere down the line somebody could imagine some misuse. <coughs> it's dual use technology after all, like Mr. Walker said. And finally, there are uh, easy ways to smuggle enhancements in across the line uh, simply by medicalizing the situation, by creating a new normal in which the um, condition you want to address is now considered a, uh, a pathology. For example, there's a gene called FA related to pain sensitivity. And there's a variant called FA out, sorry, <laughs> that 
is uh, it upregulates endogenous cannabinoids in your system so that you're less sensitive to pain. Uh, we could use that in people whose working conditions, for example, expose them to chronic pain, and they'd be happier. Uh, they'd be less pain. Also, in mice, they seem to be happier people, happier mice. So they're complacent with their lives, which might be fine, but then it takes the spotlight off the question, why are they in chronic pain in the first place? What are the social determinants of their health problems, and shouldn't we be paying attention to their working conditions? Okay, these are the examples. Um, finally, what about this last line of the um, notice, public discussion of the ethics and governance of its potential uses? I told you that in the, in the absence of consensus, a lot of the um, bioethicists say, right, in the absence of consensus, let a thousand flowers bloom, everybody should make up their own minds, and we'll have a liberal uh, policy. In the scientific context, in the context of the science policy reports, it's sort of an analogous move, which is, right, we can't get consensus about what's an enhancement and what's not an enhancement, so, Let's let the public decide. And in the National Academy of Sciences report on gene editing uh, and many others, there's this always this bottom line that defining enhancement is really tricky and difficult, so we should turn it over to society and let them decide because we scientists don't have the expertise to make these value judgments. Okay, um, here's the report I was talking about. How regulatory bodies should draw distinctions between such things as therapy and enhancement or disability and disease will require broad public debates that are highly inclusive with respect to the range of voices and how relevant concepts are defined. Well, yes, actually, I agree. Um, it will be important to have these broad public debates and to help the public understand, um, for example, what was misleading about those tweets and the film that the Academy posted. But to turn to the public for these line drawing problems is, uh, I think, going in the wrong direction. We'll see, that's kind of what our research project is about. But um, the fact of this tweet storm this last week uh, shows right away how complicated it's going to be to have a uh, a widespread public dialogue on these issues that um, is both thoughtful and, and, and creative. Um, we're not doing that very well on other social issues in this country, coming to consensus about our values and fundamental beliefs. And in fact, um, the public, surveys say, isn't so uh, upset about enhancement not as upset as uh, the science policy folks seem to be. And there's plenty of support, as you saw from the, the, uh, the film blur. Yeah, I guess that would be fine if I was uh, in control of it. Uh, I wouldn't mind giving my kid a step up in life, a little more higher IQ, et cetera. And in fact, you can already get the, your home um, a gene editing kit. Uh, uh, online, so really uh, the cat's out of the bag. Um, you can do this at, in, at home, and um, um, you don't need to worry about these lines that the science policy folk are drawing. So is enhancement then the price of, of preventive gene editing? Uh, if pre genuinely preventive gene editing interventions are penalized, they know you can't go there because it raises these worrisome enhancement concerns, real preventive benefits might be lost. Um, but if the scientific community uses this category of prevention to smuggle in interventions that raise those sorts of issues, uh, there's the risk of losing the public's 
impressed. I'll say, well, wait a minute, look, these people that are getting the uh, clotho intervention to prevent old age, to prevent disease in old age, are doing a lot better than we are. Isn't this raising the justice concerns you were worried about in enhancement? No, no, because this is prevention. And it's okay, that's just a side effect, a side benefit, a serendipitous benefit of, of prevention. That's okay. Um, I think that's going to be a position that will be very tricky to, to maintain. It kind of echoes Mr. Walker's claim about um, he's into protection and restoration, not enhancement, uh, the dual use argument. So, where does this leave us? I think the challenge for governance going forward is whether we should attempt to police this boundary between prevention and enhancement, preventive uses and problematic enhancing uses, or reconsider it, reconsider the line altogether, but reconsider what it stands for and work on those concerns directly. If we're worried about um, issues of discrimination, justice, uh, core human values like dignity. Um, let's work on the, uh, the, the context in which the science will emerge to make a, a, a society a safe place for this enterprise. Anyway, that's getting way ahead of myself because we haven't done the, the uh, research project yet. And what we'd like to do is to look upstream at this world of uh, beneficial variant research to see what we can learn about the social forces and scientific forces that are driving it. Uh, where does this interest come from and how do they see their role in the translational pipeline to clinical gene editing? Is it just a throwaway last sentence to your article that you always want to pull out some human applications to your basic research? Uh, or is that actually framing a, uh, a vision for where the scientific community wants to go. And then when we look at governance, what are the strengths and weaknesses of different models? Right now we've got two very different models competing, time and Newsweek style, uh, on the world stage. One is the WHO's expert committee developing a report on guidance for gene editing. And they're looking at this as an intergovernmental uh, public policy a problem. How are we going to work out international um, harmonization, uh, getting consensus on these issues, top-down regulation. On the other side is the International Commission sponsored by all the science academies around the world scientific community, who would much rather set the rules for themselves, see this as a matter of professional policy making, and get out in front of the rules that might come out of an initiative like the WHO's committee, so that um, um, it doesn't go off the rails. So self-governance by the scientific community or uh, external regulation by other parts of society. Uh, what's going to be better at um, helping us to either police those lines, if that's possible, or make society a safe space for um, genetic diversity when, after all, um, it's coming down the road? So, I want to acknowledge our team and our support so far. Had a couple of little uh, words to keep this work going, and uh, and thank you very much. So we have about fifteen minutes or so for questions and discussion. Um, Eric, are you okay? Monitor, moderating.
great picture, too. <laughs> so, the piece, a couple things. The, I have been very taken with the um, line taken in the Nuffield report that wasn't elsewhere. That was their first two principles that must be met, but that can't possibly do it prior to rolling this out. Right, the, the one I'm talking about in particular is the one about solidarity. Right, that the, they said that this shouldn't be deployed unless we can ensure that it's not going to create or exacerbate inequities in society. Right. Right, so individual decision making is still going to be influenced by access based on finances or access, biological access, for people whose genetics have been sufficiently studied that there's enough known that they could do something like this. So how, how do you think about that with regard to enhancement? This notion of, of not being able to concern about exacerbating or creating inequity. Yeah, I think they are, you know, right, rightly concerned about one, that's one of the um, traditional worries about enhancement <coughs> is those kinds of inequities. I guess my point is they apply as equally to treatments <laughs> mm -hmm. and preventive interventions if we come up with them um, as they do to these enhancements. So why worry about whether it's one or the other? Let's just look uh, head on at the problem of, of inequities and address those. Mm -hmm. and that's what I kind of that's what I mean in part by making society a safe place mm -hmm. for uh, these kinds of interventions. Mm -hmm. Is there someone else with me? I can also talk to him later. So, <laughs> okay, it's you. so uh, now let me see if I can remember my second question. Um, I am Justin Brosey, I believe you know. So I want to pick up on the last thing you sort of said. So there's all kinds of sources of inequity. Private tutoring gives people a boost in intelligence, being born into certain income brackets, all these sorts of things. So once we start going down that road, which you seem to be sympathetic to, why focus on this issue at all, or what makes it distinctive from these other sorts of sources of inequity? Not much. Uh, <laughs> uh, just that uh, the, the, the remit of these scientific governance bodies is to think about how we're going to deal with gene editing, but it could be uh, how we could open it up. <laughs> Okay. Hi, my name is Diana. I'm a genetic counseling student. Um, an issue that has come up for me a lot is um, regarding, you know, PGD for, for carriers, for people who are carriers, and their selection of embryos who do not have carrier status, for example. I was wondering what the long term, what you think the long term consequences of that would be if people are continually selecting against carrier embryos who'd be otherwise healthy. Specifically, um, an example is sickle cell disease, right? People with sickle cell trait are generally healthy, um, aside from some health sequela, but generally they're healthy. But if people were to continually select against sickle cell trait, for example, in theory, we would ultimately get rid of that mutation which has protective benefits against malaria or countries, you know, which would be significant in countries with malaria. So I was wondering if you could speak on, you know, your thoughts regarding situations like that. Um, well, it's hard to, uh, what was to say, it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. Uh, but the way I understand it, uh, the, you're worried about the, uh, actually having a eugenic effect on the gene pool. Um, 
the first of all, the uh, amount of people using PID to drop in the budget from the gene pool's perspective is hardly going to uh, do much to change frequencies unless everybody did it, and that seems unlikely. Second of all, um, even while we are selecting against those carriers in other parts of the world, the selective pressure is maintained by malaria and the other uh, reasons why it's in the population in the first place. So, so many dynamics in the uh, fluctuation of the gene pool, it's I, I, hard to say whether it's worth worrying about that or not. Yeah, yeah, perhaps I should have clarified. I'm probably more concerned about the principle rather than the actual effects on frequency, okay. right? Like, um, it's more about the principle of us knowing, not knowing, you know, the potential long-term consequences of, uh, you know, this, like, preventative efforts that have this kind of positive side effects and what that would entail, not so much the actual effects on frequency. Right. Uh, well, that's a, uh, it's, where to go with that? The, the, um, it, one of the uh, interesting things to think about is what kind of prevention we are aspiring to, because so far I've been mainly talking about a very traditional kind of prevention, which is preventing the manifestation of a disease in a patient. But when we start talking about genetic selection, you know, we say this PID exercise is prevention, but it's no longer preventing the manifestation of a disease or even a carrier state. Uh, within a particular patient, it's about selecting between future patients, selecting between embryos that we want to implant. Um, that's a very different form of prevention, genotypic prevention, that has a, an entirely different moral uh, baggage that comes with it. So then you start worrying about, well, what about, is it right to have selected against those folks on the basis of this one trait, which is not even that significant in terms of their health. Um, people with disabilities would say that seems like a form of genetic discrimination, um, and that's what's wrong with it. So you don't have to go much, very far into the future to say that kind of practice from that perspective um, would be a bad one to encourage selecting against carriers. So that's actually a nice segue into mine. So, I mean, there's certainly a distinction between positive and negative eugenics, but how far is, so there is an example of what you just described, right? In Iceland two years ago, there were three babies born with that syndrome. Right. Right, because there is universal screening and universal abortion of fetuses found to have Down syndrome. And those are individual choices, that's not state action. Right. I mean, how far is it, a leap to think that in a place where there is universal access to care, that there can be similar social pressure for a positive selection of an enhancement right. that would sweep through that such a country. And is that problematic? Yeah. So I think that it's, the, the logic is the same, right? Mm -hmm. So it could happen. And the question of whether it's problematic depends on how prepared we are for the uh, um, issues that were raised. I mean, that is, that is what we have in place to ensure that the uh, games we play are fair and the uh, people have access to the intervention, um, all those sort of social determinants of whether this is going to be a problematic enhancement or not. Thank you. Uh, I have a quick question. In a post-genome editing society, do you envision it looking something like this picture? <laughs> okay. Yeah. And, and perhaps uh, half the class of 2200 would look like this. Maybe so. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I put this up because uh, to a, a uh, fictional story that wrestles with this 
vision of what it would be like to have a, what society is going to have to think about um, to entertain forms of genetic enhancement is the Avengers story. Uh, mutants popping up all over the earth, discriminated against, oppressed, or dangerous because they want to take over. Um, uh, all those stories, if you've seen the movies, uh, deal with the same question about what society is going to look like as we're after we're no longer uh, locked in to our traditional form and function. Chances are that uh, humanity has a finite lifespan as a race or as a uh, genetic uh, yeah. organism. Uh, and in my view, probability is that the dark forces will have as much access to these kinds of techniques as the bright forces. Uh, in terms of what it means for long-term human uh, implications, uh, it may all be a zero-sum game in the end, but between now and then, uh, what's the main objection to just letting uh, free, free use of all these technologies, as you might give the example of China, you know, uh, others are trying it with the, uh, the noble goal of enhancing uh, individuals, but by and large, uh, if you inter, uh, universalize access and use of these technologies, do you think the good will outweigh the bad in the short time humanity has left for the relatively short time? Great question. <laughs> uh, and I have no idea uh, how that balance would, would work. Uh, but I think you know, it, it would be interesting to entertain uh, that scenario of letting a thousand flowers bloom and seeing if it ended up looking like this, or in fact, typical human behavior would channel everyone into the genetic fashion of the moment and it would actually homogenize the, the species. Okay. Hi, this is Brian Hunter, and Cleavy Fellow. Um, so I applaud your commitment to um, addressing all of the social problems that get kind of filtered into the potential for genetic enhancement. But it seems to me if we are okay with certain forms of genetic enhancement in the future, we're still not going to be able to avoid the kind of underlying question, which is, what's the goal of gene editing? What's the appropriate goal of gene editing of this technology? Okay. What's its appropriate use? So yeah. if we just let a thousand flowers bloom, there's going to be some people whose interest is more in line with disenhancement. Um, for whatever reason. So you could take the familiar example of deaf parents who wish to have deaf offspring. And I'm not making a claim, I'm not taking a stand on whether that's enhancement or not, but that's one case. <coughs> but we could imagine others, um, there might be commercial value in having, in producing humans who, have, who lack certain abilities that we think matter. And so, if we go down, if we open the Pandora's box to gene editing and goes beyond just treatment and prevention, we still have to step in and make some sorts of claims about, so what's its appropriate purpose? And I, don't, I, I think that's really hard, but I wonder if you have yeah. thoughts about that. Yeah. No, I think that's the, that's the conversation um, that we need to have. That's, that's where there is a role for everybody. In that conversation to figure out where we would like this train to go. Uh, and may, maybe in the meantime, the science policy folks are going to have to say, right, the line between enhancement and prevention is leaky and wobbly, but uh, at least it's a line. <laughs> and, and for practical and political purposes, that's why we keep reinforcing it in these reports.
Please join me in thanking Eric.